everybody. My name is Kevin Solomon. I'm a psychiatrist at UBC in Vancouver. And I'm going to start with an apology. I don't believe that anywhere in my talk, the words uh, internet, uh, Facebook, <laughs> social network, Twitter appear. So I apologize in advance. Um, conventional wisdom about self-esteem is that it arises from our experience of how we were treated, especially when we are young. If we are lucky enough to be treated well, particularly by our parents, and if they affirm and validate us and treat us with respect, then the theory is that we will grow up with positive self-esteem. Self-esteem is understood to beget self-esteem. In other words, if you approach something with self-confidence or with positive self-esteem, then you are more likely to succeed, and succeeding itself builds more self-esteem. Conversely, when your expectations are low, because of low self-esteem, you are more likely to fail, and the additional failure further lowers or weakens your self-esteem. This way of thinking lies at the root uh, and is the conceptual premise of the power of positive thinking movement. It reflects the circumstantial or good luck, bad luck theory of self-esteem. The cure for low self-esteem, conceived of in this lack-of-the-draw way, is to succeed and to keep succeeding, because success builds healthy or positive self-esteem. Countering low self-esteem becomes a matter of finding ways and areas in which to succeed. Now, while this approach can be helpful for some of us, some of the time, it may not be possible for all of us all of the time. There is another way to understand the source and purpose of self-esteem. Human beings are social creatures and live in communities. The survival of each individual and the survival of each community of individuals relies on the interdependence between members of the social grouping. This interdependence is more apparent and more readily appreciated when we consider the odds of survival when humans banded together in small groups, as we did for most of human history. It is only in the last one or two hundred years or so that, that humans have lived in much larger social structures, such that our interdependence upon each other has become somewhat obscured. So the question then arises, how we as human beings cooperate with each other, given our propensity to individuality, and our drive for individual survival. What forces encourage this cooperation? Where are they located? And how do they work? I suggest that low self-esteem is the key driver of this cooperative social behavior, and that it is an ingenious and extremely effective and economical way of ensuring social cohesion, and that because it is so necessary for our individual and group survival, it emerges spontaneously and early in the course of our lives. I propose that this state of low self-esteem or worthlessness emerges universally in the course of normal, healthy development and not accidentally according to the lack of the draw of who our parents happened to be. This is how I think low self-esteem fosters and facilitates social survival. Consider that we come to the realization of our intrinsic worthlessness or the low self-esteem state when we are three or four years old and that we do so for reasons for which we do not have time to go into uh, at this time. But suffice it to say that it occurs in the course of our normal, healthy, emotional and intellectual development. The main effect of low, self, uh, of low self-esteem is the emergence of the need to please the need to please others in order to have our needs met. And that this is synonymous with us being worth having our needs met, which in turn is synonymous with us being worthwhile. Being worthwhile is the same thing as the state of positive self-esteem. In other words, being cared for is the same thing to our emotional minds as being worth being cared for, or in other words, being worthwhile. The converse of this is also true, that not being cared for 
means that we are not worth being cared for, that we are not worth the while of someone else or others to care for us. In other words, that we are not worthwhile, or that we are worthless. Since we need others to care for us in order to live and survive, we need to make sure that others do care for us, and we set out to accomplish this by trying to please others. Low self-esteem or the awareness of our innate worthlessness drives us to please, or to try to please, those upon whom we depend for our care. Low self-esteem forces us to become pleasers. Now, generally speaking, the things that are pleasing to those upon whom we depend are by and large the behaviors, attitudes, and values that are shared by the rest of the group, clan, or community. Behaviors that are adapted to successful community living are the ones that will be encouraged and reinforced by those whom we try to please and will become part of our own behavioral repertoires. Notwithstanding the fact that we meet with greater or lesser degrees of success in our attempts to please, we are all moved to try to please, and through this we all engage in social learning. Thus, low self-esteem serves as an internal driver and reward mechanism for having our individual, our individual needs met, and at the same time for learning the codes, norms, rules and laws that govern our social interactions and function. Rules and laws in this sense are essentially nothing more than the condensation of our collective experience and knowledge of what activities are best suited to our group survival. Imagine the extremely unlikely, if not impossible, scenario where you are being courted by two different suitors. It's pretty strange in itself, right? But it gets weirder. <laughs> These two suitors are identical in every respect, except that one is inherently a low self-esteemer and the other is an innately high self-esteemer. If you have the freedom to choose between these two suitors, the chances are that you will choose the high self-esteemer, because high self-esteemers are, or seem to be, more attractive. Their self-confidence can be infectious and reassuring. All things being equal, the likely outcome of this choice is that the high self-esteemer, who does not need your approval in order to feel worthwhile, is less likely to try to please you and is less likely, therefore, to take your interests, preferences, and feelings into account. High self-esteemers are more likely to literally love and leave you, and literally leave you holding the baby, because they are less invested in your view and opinion of them than low self-esteemers are. Low self-esteemers need your approval as a matter of psychological survival, because without it, they will experience themselves as being worthless. And it is only your approval that enables them to feel worthwhile. I actually had a thought of making a bumper sticker that said, we self-esteemers make better lovers. <laughs> and I still do that. This is what it means to have low self-esteem. When you are left to your own devices, you are worthless. And the only means by which you can experience yourself as being worthwhile is by having someone else relate to you, as though you mattered, as though you were worth caring for. It is only when someone else values you that you can experience yourself as being valuable or worthwhile. So since low self-esteemers are better and more considerate lovers, and make for more dependable life partners, over time eventually more and more low self-esteemers will reproduce. <laughs> Sorry to the Olympic champion. <laughs> it's not personal. <clears throat> and a preponderance of low self-esteem genes, if there is such a thing, will enter and dominate the gene pool. But low self-esteem is not only make better lovers, but also, all other things being equal, make better students and better scholars. Because of the same need to please, Low self-esteemers are more likely to listen to and try to emulate their elders, 
and so will be more likely to learn from them. For most of human history, the things that are to be learned related directly to survival skills, to knowledge related to acquiring food, shelter, and safety. So those with an inner drive to please were more likely to acquire this knowledge and to learn these skills, and so were more likely than their high self-esteem counterparts to be able to provide for themselves and their offspring, and therefore more likely to successfully raise their young to the point where their young could reach maturity and reproduce themselves and their low self-esteem genes. With time, not only are, these more, uh, are there more low self-esteemers reproducing, but also more low self-esteemers successfully rearing the next generation or generation to the point where they can successfully reproduce. It is this biologically adaptive advantage that accounts for the fact that low self-esteemers are the universal and dominant type amongst humans, and that innate high self-esteemers are the rare exception, because they, <coughs> high self-esteemers, are less well adapted to the optimum conditions for replication. The condition of low self-esteem confers biological advantage with regard to both reproduction and rearing, the two cardinal elements required for the perpetuation of life. The low self-esteem state does so by instilling the powerful drive to please others, which in turn fosters social learning. Low self-esteem is therefore biologically adapted survival mechanism for social creatures. The problem, therefore, is not with low self-esteem per se, but rather with failing low self-esteem in contrast to successful low self-esteem. But that distinction is a subject for another discussion. <laughs> Thank you for your time.